Okay. Uh, Gen, what's up? How are you, man? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of start this conversation. Obviously, you're the founder of Retainable. Um, you help B2B companies kind of improve their retention. Um, but I kind of wanted to start just from my perspective on, on why retention is so important. Um, last year, I took a course uh, by, uh, by Reforge called Growth Series, and it was founded by Brian Balfour. He's the former VP of Growth at HubSpot. Six-week uh, growth course, and the, the first week is concentrated on retention and engagement. And so um, it was very intentional why Brian had, had started the first week of this kind of like growth marketing course on retention and, and engagement. And I think it really is uh, kind of like a foundation of, of any growth uh, strategy. Um, and so I wanted to kind of read a little little quote to start and then kind of get your thoughts on it and then we can yeah. make, uh, roll from there because I think it's cool. cool. Um, so he says, he says, um, every improvement that you make to retention also improves all of these other things, virality, LTV, payback period, it is literally the foundation to all of growth, and that's really why retention is the king. Um, so I'd love to kind of know what your thoughts on, on that quote are. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, implicit in that statement is that it's a subscription business, right? Because, like, there, there's retention for e-commerce, but that's a totally different thing, whether it's a subscription e-com or just second orders, third orders. Uh, but, yeah, there, there is no subscription business if – you get one customer and two leave out the back door or you get a customer and then they stay for two months and then uh, churn out uh, the economics of the subscription business just don't add up. If you're not able to have a lifetime value, you know, like a multiple of your acquisition costs and right. that lifetime value is incrementally ramped up with every single month that you're sustainably able to keep customers around. So uh, yeah, I, I started retainable a year ago, really kind of from seeing this from the inside perspective of what happens when churn is a challenge, a, a persistent challenge. So this was at Jungle Scout, which is uh, a subscription software business that helps entrepreneurs find products to sell on Amazon. And I joined early on, was one of the early first employees, uh, took over the marketing team. And this was in fall of 2015. And selling on Amazon was kind of in its nascent stages of gaining popularity and, and becoming a viable channel. So there were a lot of people that were interested in selling on Amazon, um, which was fantastic. We were able to really grow the market quickly and we were early and had a great content effort. So quickly became the thought leader in the space. Uh, so people, anybody, whether it was like you, me, or an eight figure e-commerce business, all kind of gravitated towards Jungle Scout to help guide their Amazon efforts. Um, that, that trajectory was fantastic when we were able to quickly acquire customers and for cheap, especially, you know, considering the content marketing efforts. But, you know, once things got a little more competitive and there were other alternatives and uh, th then the challenge of churn kind of reared its head in terms of, you know, like, if you're just starting out and you're at X percent in churn, that's one thing. But then if it's the same percentage in your, you know, eight, nine figures ARR, then it's a whole other story. So that was always a benchmark in terms of acquisition costs that needed or acquisition to continue net growth. And so that, that was, it just reinforced that, that quote that you mentioned is that if there isn't a solidified install base that you can continue to build upon, then it's churn is just going to continue. You're, you're kind of just on quicksand acquiring a customer as you're losing customers. And it's very, very hard to get traction to grow month over month. I know that you worked um, in multiple positions even before uh, Jungle Scout working in, in growth. And so I'm sure that you've had your hand at, um, all kind of aspects, not only retention, but also, you know, paid marketing, content marketing, kind of like the, the full funnel. Um, is there any reason that you decided to focus on retention specifically? Was there something that was like more interesting to, to you particularly? Yeah, well, I don't really see retention as a channel per se. It's more of like the lagging indicator. Like there's a lot, it's kind of multifaceted. You know, there's like, there's the product experience, which goes beyond really what I do, but then there's, 
you know, the onboarding experience. And that includes like email marketing or the in-app experience or the support documentation or just a general like customer success approach. And, um, and so from that perspective, I find it fascinating because there's a quantitative aspect where you're like really diving into what the product analytics are and, you know, like a cohort analysis is, is like a great example of that where you're trying to like pick apart what different segments are and what the behaviors are. Uh, but then, you know, combine that with a qualitative element of, you know, like how do we get more people to the, you know, their, their aha moment or, or their first value, moment of value in the app quicker. Right. And, you know, that might be getting an email through, getting them to open it. And then that's where kind of like the consumer behavior and, and the psychology as well as the copywriting and the email marketing come into play. So, yeah, I mean, I think retention is kind of like what the final output is, but right. all the inputs are kind of like a holistic marketing strategy. And when you, obviously you've worked with a couple of clients with, with your agency thus far, um, are there any kind of initial things that, that stick out when, when you work with folks? Is there anything that like across the board um, you could say that people are, are doing wrong? Uh, not across the board. And I think that's an interesting thing is that like the, the challenge of churn is kind of unique to every product and every type of customer. However, I think they're like the value that I try to bring is to bring a strategic approach. I think a lot of companies might see the churn strategy almost in the reactive sense. And it might be like, all right, it's a little bit late. So let's try and like save this customer. But I think that there's a lot that can be done a few steps before in order to you know hook them into the product more or get them to you know do whatever the key actions are and you know for example like we were talking about rally like how do we actually get them to you know like add something to their calendar to know when to go and and buy a product if there's a very short window so right. i think um understanding that you know like what they're trying to achieve and being strategic about it and I think that really starts from the, like the very first moment of onboarding. And so one thing that some companies might not do is actually understand what the customer's goals are, you know, like, like sure. rally, for example, are they there to, uh, you know, spend money kind of, or like invest money for fun or are they interested in the product itself or do they actually want to make a financial return on that? And I think understanding what the customer's goals are at the very start and then bringing them through the different paths and uh, kind of like speaking to that customer on an individual basis. Um, sure. Of course, that's at scale uh, is super important. So that's one thing is like the very first moments of onboarding. Uh, and then I've seen a couple of gaps in kind of like towards the end of the, you know, like we'll call it the offboarding. And I've seen more third party software products that pop up, but just to capture what the reasons for churn are mm. and to, to understand that, you know, is it a product thing? Is it a competitive thing? Is it, you know, a pricing thing, which really comes down to the value that they're getting. Uh, and then that kind of like can help inform whether it is a product issue or marketing or onboarding or success. Um, so kind of like getting the bookends of the very first moments and understanding what the customer is sure. all the way through to like why and where are customers churning out. So it, it sounds like, um, a lot of people might might think about churn kind of like I'm, I'm saving this customer that is already we're already in the process of losing rather than how am I going to optimize the initial experience. Um, it's interesting. I kind of go back to thinking about uh, Reforge and and one of B Brian Balfour, um, one of his retention curves. And he talks about how just like a, a slight improvement in retention in like first week, second week retention, um, that curve goes up. And it, it's so much more impactful if you go down the line, like the impact that the, the impact that an optimization on the onboarding process has on the customer life cycle um, is, is so large and, and like exponential, essentially. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you, you see a bunch of different retention curves. The most drastic ones are obviously going to be like a B2C app. Maybe, you know, it might be like Rally where in the first what is it like the stats like the first seven days they like b2c mobile apps will lose like half their customers or something so yeah totally even just like you know we're all about flattening the curve these days in the coronavirus stuff but like how do you kind of like 
yeah, flatten it so it's not as steep and uh, understanding on a kind of like an individual level at scale those goals are and then getting them to you know that first moment of like all right this is why i signed up for rally this is why i signed up for jungle scout it will certainly um, flatten that and, and help improve retention in the very early onboarding stages it's also something um for me you know i come from the uh the ba a background in, in paid acquisition customer acquisition and so um in that world a lot of folks a lot of companies will hire agencies to run their performance marketing for them and then they'll say okay um, we want you to be focused on this very specific CAC goal. And then the agency will do everything that it can to kind of reach that CAC goal, maybe at the behest of, of retention, right? They're maybe not paying as much attention to LTV. And so yeah. I, the way that I see retention is like you're, you're improving when you make improvements to LTV, you have the ability to then inflate what you can acquire a customer for and so that gives you a little bit more leverage to test out and experiment with different channels. For sure. I mean, agency paid ad, ad agencies is like a whole other thing, you know, like in we're talking <laughs> about percentage of spend and alignment of incentives. And so that, that's, that's different, but like, yeah, if you think about, you know, like a typical B2B SaaS company and how they, how a company's at large might, tied together this really important goal of like customer retention and, and particularly between like customer success and sales. Like it's the same thing, you know, it's a salesperson is most incentivized to get a customer to sign up. Um, but some companies that are, are maybe prudent of like the, the quality and the value of the customer, ensuring that it's sure. a fit um, might not pay out or on that bonus or that commission, you know, until that customer renews X months down the line. Um, just to ensure that the incentive is aligned, that they're sending the right, they're signing up the right customers. Um, because yeah, churn can happen even before a customer is acquired. If it's, you know, bad signups to bad experiences, it, it's really important that the expectations of what the customer has going in are aligned to what the product experience can deliver. Uh, and so um, a lot of that is connected by, you know, the onboarding or the communication. How do you think about the blend of having specific customer segments and having specific experiments, uh, experiences for those customers with kind of being over segmented? Because I know that might be a challenge where you might have eight to 10 different like popular customer segments, but of course, building out different creative, building out different onboarding flows for those different customer segments might be a bit challenging. How do you think about the balance there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think that's maybe the end goal at a certain point. Um, however, there's also diminishing returns of, you know, like getting so granular at that point, you may just want to like do, you know, individual outreach. Uh, it also depends on the type of company that we're talking about. If it is something like at scale, like rally, or if it's something that's uh, a little more enterprise in, in terms of what the average revenue per user is. And in that case, there's, you know, a, a uh, an account rep, um, right. but that account manager might have a playbook that they're following. Uh, but I think maybe like, um, I don't have a number on what would actually make sense in terms of like the number of paths or, or personas. However, I'd, I'd imagine that there might be like maybe somewhere from three to five in terms of like what the customer profile is and what their goals are. And then uh, what their, what their first like moment of value in that, in the app is and so i think uh of course it it would differ to each company each product but yeah you're right it, it wouldn't make sense to have a million different or, or a handful of different onboarding flows um, because i think it's also important to consider what the internal workings of the you know the onboarding experience is uh that it has to be scalable and, and this is right. something that um, somebody else will jump in and you, you really want the automation to be kind of like self-explanatory and not overly complex um, where you're, you're having emails. Uh, and this is something I've seen with the larger companies uh, where the end customer is getting emails from, you know, customer success or mm -hmm. product or marketing or growth. Uh, and then on, on the, uh, on the recipients end, it's not the best, most cohesive experience. 
Um, and I think that that happens when everybody's trying to get their hand in uh, and have their voice heard. Um, so, you know, like maybe simplifying things has its real benefits. For sure. Um, so I know, I know you primarily work with um, B2B companies. And of course, I kind of came up, up and reached out to you um, when I was at Rally, a, a fintech, a, a B2C platform, um, because the customer journey and because of the, the challenges that we had with, with retention there. Um, and any kind of B2B company um, can kind of uh, connect with you. Or you're very open to kind of doing it, an audit. Um, when, when you kind of conduct that initial audit and that free consultation and you have that initial conversation, um, what do you, what do you uh, hope to approach or hope to get out of that first meeting? What do I hope to get out of? You know, yeah. What do you hope to learn? Yeah. Um, well, really, like what the main challenge is. In that sense, it gets a little bit meta because you know, like yeah. I'm trying to understand like what your problems are. Uh, it wouldn't make sense for me to spout off like a bunch of like best practices because that would that would obviously just not make sense. Um, and so every challenge has its own nuances, um, whether it is you know about bandwidth or data or like just a straight up problem of keeping customers um, so yeah that, that's kind of like the first goal is for me I would love to know like what the challenges are why how can I be of most help um, and so I'm reading like Seth Godin now this is marketing and I think like he really distills it down into um, making marketing almost sound like like a heroic effort you know like you're finding okay. out what is this person what what is their need and then how can I be of service to them? And so um, in some ways, that's, that's the same mentality that I'm trying to take. Um, and then from there, some level of like transparency or openness, vulnerability in terms of like where there are challenges because a lot of companies might not want to share everything. Totally understandable. I mean, I, I, sure. I do um, make it clear. I, I don't talk about anything. It's more just so that I can make... Uh, more informed recommendations um, based on that but uh, it might be like you know what what's the what are some of the numbers in terms of like acquisition cost or in terms of churn or like when are they churning and you might look at that like you know like um, at what point in the journey or what are the most important features what are the customers looking for so just to have a short dialogue and then I like to go in and, and kind of have the customer experience myself if possible right um, to kind of like piece it all together um, and when you do have that customer experience for, for the first time, I, I think that's so important too. even, even as a marketer, um, it's very easy to kind of design campaigns and design creative thinking about, okay, what am I trying to get the customer? What, what do I want the customer to do rather than what does the customer actually want to do? Um, and so I really like that you take that approach. I was very impressed when you did that at rally that you signed up, you went through the onboarding flow, you were able to, to pick things apart, um, you really thought like a, like the customer in that perspective. Oh yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, one one tool that I've found helpful, I've used more and more is kind of like a, a customer journey map, uh, and it doesn't need to be anything fancy. You know, like I, I do do it just like on a spreadsheet. Um, but you know, if you can imagine, you have like what the funnel might look like from you know awareness to uh, consideration to acquisition, and and then like the onboarding stuff of like. Uh, retention and referral stuff um, but like having that go across and then like what are the the different customer challenges or objections or questions at each stage and then how is a company actually communicating with a customer and, and addressing each of these things to move them through the journey uh, right. and so that's just like a helpful framework that I use either like jotting it down writing it through or talking through it um, to understand like where where there might be some disconnect between like getting people through, you know, in, in particular from like the point of sign up, the point of acquisition through, you know, whether you have a free trial or, you know, like rally was free. It was just a matter of like getting them to invest or, right. uh, you know, once they're paid extending that subscription, uh, that's like really having that customer empathy and understanding uh, the objections and the questions at those particular stages is really helpful, um, especially when plotted against the, the ways that you're currently speaking to them, you know, whether it's email or, or um, in-app or, or one-off emails, uh, helpful to understand where the gaps might be. 
Um, there's probably, you know, obviously there, there's probably some baseline metrics. Like there's always going to be obviously drops, drop offs throughout the, the funnel, right? When you kind of do this analysis and you kind of go through the, the customer journey, um, is, do you generally find that like one, one kind of step in the funnel, there's like a larger gap and then you're like, oh, I really have to hit here. Like, oh, we're getting um, a, a very efficient cost per install, but then like people aren't signing up or like people aren't signing up, but then they're not, they're not converting into buyers or they're not staying. Like, do you, do you normally find that like there's one specific gap that that's causing a lot of trouble? Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, I hate to say it, it depends, but I think you kind of alluded to it earlier is, um, you know, it, when you consider the retention curve, where can like the biggest like, bend in the curve make the biggest difference generally it would be you know in, in the first increment whether it's like you know a month or a quarter or whatever um, to make those improvements in keeping customers um, because I think that's that's where improved retention ultimately happens is like you know they get it they understand it they, they you know make whatever connections or integrations that they're doing to get locked in or right. that's that's where the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, is made as opposed to, you know, like the, the tailing off towards, you know, like month 10 and, and then you're definitely improving. Um, but it's at, you know, the, it might be, you know, like 40, 50, 60% of the initial cohort. So you really want to kind of right. like start early. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, the other thing that, that you realize is that uh, these different stages in the funnel, um, different teams within a company impact that. Yeah. Um, and so like earlier on, it might be more of a blend of like marketing and, and product. And then there might be some kind of engineering issues. Um, who, I guess like when you do work with companies, like it, are you working with the CMO? Are you working with the CTO? And then when you do start to work, like what kind of like cross-functional challenges do you kind of start to pick up? Yeah. So um, I generally, it depends on the size of the company, but uh, whoever might be owning, you know, like retention or the onboarding flow. Um, so it has been the founders or, or um, CFOs or people uh, on the marketing team as well. Um, Challenges again, it, it kind of depends on the type of company because like the, the larger teams, there definitely are more hands and, and more things to consider. Um, sure. So that's a little bit of a challenge in terms of like, I think philosophy of testing and getting things out faster uh, is to the benefit in some ways. Uh, but the, the upside of having more parties involved is that there, there's more like data driven perspectives um you know like each team might have certain metrics that they're measuring that are informative to that experience uh, so it's it's kind of like a matter of like move moving fast with some gaps in data versus uh having more people to coordinate yet maybe like a more informed slower decision uh so right. that's kind of like the spectrum that I found, and a lot of that is based on uh, the size of the company. But I think for the most part, if, if I am working with a company, there is a universal understanding that churn is a problem, a big problem, and also an urgent problem because you know it's it is something that you want to address fast because you know the the if you're losing ten percent of customers out of the gate, you know like imagine if you could get them uh, to understand the value that you deliver. I mean, then you might get that realize a full lifetime value as opposed to just a small fraction from month one. Right. That makes sense. Um, I was, I was looking at your site and know that you kind of have this process of like research, analyze, execute, iterate. Um, and I find that like very interesting. I think it, it, it makes sense as kind of like a, a, a sequential um, strategy. Um, I'm interested in that final part that, that iterate. Um, so you've done the research, you've done the analysis, you've, you've executed on kind of the, the strategies. Um, how do you think about the, that, that final piece and like making ongoing changes? Sure. Yeah. So what I mean by that generally is like the initial strategy, you know, and, and use rally, for example. And again, like I've never worked with rally, never seen the numbers, but it might be just like, you know, as a good example that we both understand, uh, right. 
you know, like for example, it, it would just start with a segment of the population and a hypothesis. So we might say like, all right, for, for iOS users in America, let's, let's test this flow. And then um, depending on how that goes, all right, maybe it's, maybe you try iOS in, in Europe or South America, or, or maybe it's like go Android. And, and so it's, it's like in the very beginning, it's kind of like understanding what the data might say and then taking a hypothesis and just starting with a very small segment of that and then scaling it out because it doesn't, you know, it, it, again, it's not like um, you could torpedo the whole company, but it is relatively delicate in terms of like, you, you can't just make changes outright, assuming that it, it would be better. Uh, so it's kind of always safest and I think most prudent to roll things out incrementally. Uh, so that's right. kind of like what I like to do in terms of iteration is, taking the, the small segment that you'd initially test on and then expanding that um, as okay. well as, you know, like trying different things of what the learnings might reveal from a test. Cool. Um, so I know that we're, we're just at, at time. Obviously people can, can find you at uh, retainable. Um, that's your agency. Yeah, retainable.com. Uh, Retainable.com. Yep. And, uh, and, and book a free consultation. I'll, I'll say that when I went through the process at, at rally with you, um, and kind of the, the learnings that you presented, it was, it was extremely like actionable stuff and, uh, it was, was really cool. Um, wondering like if you have any other, any other thoughts, any, any parting words, any parting words. Um, I mean, it, it, now it's, it's a, what is it? April 16th. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy times. <laughs> yeah. It's a very unique time. And I think like all of a sudden what's really interesting is that it's, it's really helped people focus on, you know, what their, what their most important needs are. And, you know, there's like the personal side of it, you know, like Maslow's hierarchy and like make sure that everybody's safe and healthy. But then like in terms of the business perspective, then people are really like hunkering down and focusing on their best asset, which is their existing customers. They want to make sure that like, man, with this situation going on, let's do everything that we can in order to keep yeah. our customers. So, you know, like proactively reach out to people um, for people that are churning, uh, you know, why are they churning? And is it a matter of like a COVID related issue? So maybe we can extend a, a free discount or, or a free few months or, um, and so I think like in, in this situation, a lot of these things that have been kind of overshadowed by this constant need to acquire and grow faster, right. Have, like grown in importance. So, uh, I, I would just hope that that kind of mentality uh, continues further and it's not necessarily just like a crisis related mentality. And I think it probably will um, because I just think it's the most uh, cost effective and scalable way to grow. Cool. Um, again, th uh, thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, hopefully maybe I'll be uh, seeing you in Austin someday soon. Yeah, no doubt. Thanks, Paul. Okay, bye.